Hello and welcome to Portfolio Matters, week 109 and it's been another exciting week in the markets, not necessarily in a good way. And Stuart Owen is dialing in from Tokyo early on Friday morning. But before we get into it, Stuart will read the disclaimer. Everything discussed during the Portfolio Matters podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be considered as investment advice. Listeners should be aware that we will be discussing securities that we own or have a financial interest in. Please do your own research or consult a professional investment advisor before making any decisions regarding topics mentioned on the show. And a full disclaimer can be found at the end. Okay, Keith, what have we got? Thanks, Stuart. Well, before we get going, next week on Thursday on the Discord, Rogue Trader a fellow podcaster, and I will be doing a live Q&A for Discord members. I hope you will join us. There is a lot going on in the world. Okay, first of all, the news. Well, during the week, the International Criminal Court issued an arrest warrant for Vladimir Putin, who now is going to find it difficult to travel internationally, apart from between a few allies such as China and Belarus. But the big news for the week was that last weekend, Credit Suisse was taken over by UBS in a deal brokered by the Swiss authorities for 0.76 Swiss francs per share. We have a section on that coming up. Janet Yellen has promised to protect depositors in U.S. small banks with similar measures to Silicon Valley Bank and Signature Bank, if necessary, but has ruled out a blanket uh, guarantee of deposits currently. UK inflation, unfortunately, came in hot once again, rising in February. We have a section on that. And the UK Bank of England raised rates by 0.25% to 4.25%, despite the banking turmoil, as did the Fed. It raised rates by 0.25% to a range between 4.75% and 5%. Uh, But it also accompanied that raise with a change in language, and it no longer describes its monetary policy as ongoing increases in interest rates and it now says some additional policy firming may be appropriate the imf has agreed a three billion bailout of sri lanka now on credit suisse finma the swiss regulator waived competition law and the need for a shareholder vote to get the ubs takeover of credit suisse done And the deal was executed at a 60% discount to the closing price on Friday. But the Swiss authorities broke the priorities of the capital structure and wrote off $7 billion worth of 81s, which should stand above the equity in the capital structure. So shareholders got some money holders of the 81s got written down to zero lawsuits are pending and the swiss national bank has also provided a hundred billion swiss bank liquidity line to ubs some charts relating to the news well this is the credit suisse share price which is down 99 percent from its peak before it's taken over And all that has led to a tightening of financial conditions. So the fear now is a credit crunch as banks look to shore up their balance sheet and protect their capital ratios. But all the financial conditions indices tend to look at market-based measures such as VIX or the Move Index and they're more an indication of financial stress in the markets than actual credit conditions for small and large businesses, which is what we are actually concerned with, so should be treated with some caution. The failure of Silicon Valley Bank and Credit Suisse 
has led to a flight to safety out of the banks into money market funds. And that withdrawal of deposits will place additional stress on the banks and is ongoing. We have a special section on banks coming up. Keith, just before we move on from that, um, about money market funds, I thought it might be interesting for many of our viewers and listeners um, to rethink about the experience during the global financial crisis, where there was a lot of debate and worry about cash and how secure that would be at banks and mm. brokers, etc. And I remember at the time, I, I put a lot of my uh, any spare cash into the equivalent of a money market fund, in my case, like an ETF of um, short dated bonds, because then it becomes a security and a security which is custodied somewhere. And yes. therefore, it's not a deposit, which is the liability of a bank. So that hasn't received too much attention. People have mainly been thinking about money market funds and the higher return they can they can earn. But for me, it was the fact that it got off the, the bank's mm -hmm. balance sheet and became a security custody somewhere else, and therefore yes. mine. Yes, so absolutely. Just something to highlight. Mm. Yeah, no, good, very good point, Stuart. And actually, I something I've been aware of on my own brokerage accounts over the last few days. If you hold cash on the brokerage account, as Stuart's just said, that becomes a liability of the bank. And if the bank goes bust, you become a creditor above the uh, guarantee, which in the UK, case of the UK is at £85,000, I believe. So any cash above £85,000, you want to buy something. If you buy a money market fund or any security, then that should be yours in the case of the bank going bust. Now, reminder that the reason we're in this difficulties, the global banking systems in has these problems is that during the pandemic and before the central banks of the world were pursuing QE, which artificially depressed long-term rates. And therefore the banks had to loan at very long, at very low interest rates. Now, as interest rates have risen, so the value of their loans and securities they bought when interest rates were really low have plummeted. And because the central banks thought that inflation was, in quotes, transitory, they failed to react as quickly as they should have done, meaning they've had to raise rates faster and higher than they otherwise would have done. And the speed with which they've raised rates has placed additional stress on the banking system. QE turns out not to be a symmetrical policy. So it's very easy to buy stuff from the banks and pump them full of cash. It is much more difficult to reverse that policy. And essentially, every time they've tried to reverse it, they have caused stress to the system and they've had to stop the tightening. That is exactly what's happened now as the Fed's balance sheet is rising rapidly as US banks tap the Fed's credit line. Yeah, I've always wondered how much um, issues for, for borrowers are to do with the price of money and how much is the simple availability, the quantity of it. And mm. I have a suspicion that actually you know, many projects or even investment speculations can survive a bit higher rates. What they can't survive is um, you know, a margin call and a requirement for a big lump of money. So quite often it's the quantity, not the price. Yes, good point. And this is the effect of Janet Yellen's speech early in the week in which she ruled out providing blanket deposit insurance for US banks. This is for the performance of banks during the FOMC conference. And when Jay Powell was speaking, the market was quiescent. And then when Yellen spoke, suddenly it sold off. Now, this crisis is ongoing. We are recording this on Friday morning. And yesterday, the CDS, the credit default swaps, Barclays, Deutsche Bank and Sock Gen were all rising sharply. And this is the credit default swap of Deutsche Bank. And it's currently at 525 basis points. And that is already getting dangerous. 
the market is saying that it is wary of funding Deutsche Bank. Now, the other thing that's happening is reminder that the US has hit the debt ceiling. And this is the amount of cash the US government has in its checking account, the Treasury General account. And last week, it spent $136 billion in three days. Now, the next data point we get is later today, but it only had around $208 billion left. So at this rate, it will be rapidly de depleting its current account. Now, in April, the US should get some tax revenues, which should see it through for a bit. But by July, it could well be that the US government is running out of cash. Now, we know from the employment figures that the US has been adding government jobs recently. Historically, when it starts to run out of cash, it starts shedding them. So watch this space. And on to this week's economic data. Now, we only had a limited amount of data this week, so I'll go through most of it. So UK public sector borrowing requirement for February came out, and that was worse than expectations because the UK has extended the energy price guarantee. But the big news of the week for the UK was inflation, which was very depressing, frankly. So UK CPI was expected at 9.9%, i.e. down from January, and it actually rose to 10.4%, up 0.3% month on month compared to January. We look at the month on month number, then CPI rose 1.1% in February way above expectations. And reminder, in January, it actually fell 0.6%. Corp CPI also beat and beat substantially, coming in at 6.2% compared to expectations of 57 And RPI came in at 13.8%, month on month, up 1.2%. So it really other, is grim, isn't it? Yeah, it's that's very just grim. such awful numbers. Yeah. I had a quick look. I mean, it's not like this 10.4% on the, the UK CPI is you know, coming off a, a bad number last year. Last year was, was the first, in a sense, peak and plateau where CPI this time last year was over 6%. So over two years, you've had you know about 17% um, mm. erosion of the purchasing power. It, it's really pretty painful. Yeah, absolutely. And we're, we've got a breakdown of the inflation numbers in a bit and you'll see actually a lot of it's coming from food so you know food inflation really hits the poorest members of society now a lot of that food inflation though comes from the energy crisis and the fact that a lot of the greenhouses were closed down and not producing cucumbers and peppers etc now that the energy crisis is easing you'd hope that food inflation eases in the coming months and on to the US. Well, industrial production continues to disappoint. So the manufacturing sector in the US is certainly not doing well. We had the University of Michigan surveys of US consumers during the week. And that wasn't great, actually. It shows the bounce in February was fading in March before the banking crisis started to hit. Uh, but the good news was home sales, which were just absolutely mind blowing, given the increase in mortgage rates and also the increase in home prices, which have destroyed home affordability, which is at its lowest level ever. And despite that, US home sales rose 14.5% month on month in February. Now, I was speaking to one of our US viewers yesterday, and he was saying what's going on in his area of the of the US, which is Texas, is that buyers are back in the market and taking on mortgages at very high interest rates in the expectation that 
those high interest rates won't last and they'll be able to refinance within the next couple of years. Now, they can do that as long as employment holds up and they are confident of retaining their job. A downturn in the employment market should undermine their confidence in doing that. And finally, we had some quarterly data. And for Q4 in the Eurozone, the labor cost numbers were not reassuring. And so it showed accelerating wage growth way above expectations. Some charts, Stuart. Uh, okay, so this is the UK public sector borrowing requirement, which um, there had been a good number the previous month, but has relapsed, uh, as Keith said, uh, uh, energy costs weighing on the um, UK government uh, balance there. UK CPI, or well, this horrible number where we've been hoping that it was rolling over and was going to decline as the, the States has done, but uh, no luck so far, uh, it's got worse. And looking at that on a month on month basis, you can see that 1.1% is a particularly awful number. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the core CPI, if we're trying to be a bit more positive, um, just uh, 6%. Again, no real sign of uh, having rolled over. And I think later there's some breakdown of um, uh, goods and services, and it, it's pretty uh, pretty grim whichever way you cut the cake. Uh, RPI, the, the old measure, I mean, if you were a chartist, if Richard was here, you, that you wouldn't say that there's any, any sign of that having um, uh, rolled over. It, uh, it's awful. Uh, UK CBI industrial orders, um, uh, pretty poor there. Um, what's that about? Minus 18 uh, on, on that measure. I mean, it was worse during the, uh, the uh, pandemic, but um, uh, pretty grim. Uh, EU wage growth uh, year on year, 5.1%. Um, obviously, we wouldn't have expected that a couple of years ago. Nothing quite that strong. Um, so some, some good growth, but obviously that's fighting against um, high inflation. Uh, so real wages are still falling. EU construction output. I think we've spoken about this in, in previous um, uh, Fridays where it, it's, it's not great, but it, it's not as bad as you might have thought. Yeah. So it's still growing year on year, um, about 1%. US industrial production, um, pretty much flat now. Uh, obviously, many of these charts for years are going to be distorted by, by the pandemic and the the big minus and big plus of the following year. But if you try to exclude that by eye, then um, it's obviously not a great number. Um, and there is talk of a US sort of manufacturing renaissance, but uh, we we're not seeing it in the short term numbers at least. US existing home sales, well, um, as uh, Keith has got a section on this later, but it, it was flabbergasting, the, the rise um, in home sales. I mean, have a look at that chart. It's, it's sort of off the charts. Yeah. And very unexpected, given what's happened to uh, to mortgage rates. Uh, U.S. home sales. Well, uh, there you can see that that big bounce. Um, nothing like it's not back yet to the, the pre-pandemic levels, but um, a very strong bounce uh, on, on the one month view anyhow. Um, so if we look at home sales versus mortgage applications, which is the, the chart here, it does give a big cause for, for, for cause for pause, as it were. Yes, there has been that very big um, monthly bounce in, in home sales, but there's usually a very strong correlation with mortgage applications, which unsurprisingly are, are weakening given the, the mortgage rates that people are now facing. So the suspicion is the, the home sales and bounce can't continue. So the rise in home sales has largely been driven by cash buyers, and presumably at some stage they'll run out of cash. <laughs> so uh, just looking at not just the applications for mortgages, but the price of mortgages, um, well, after having shot up to over 7%, it's now seemingly settling up more like 6.5%. Now, I believe that I mean one of the, in a sense, unique aspects of the US mortgage market is you, you can take out a 30-year mortgage, sit with it if it, if you, if it suits you, but um, you are able to refinance you know, if rates fall. So although I wouldn't be copying the behavior of um, Keith's Texas friend, um, you can see some logic to that, where mm. if you've, in a sense, got an option to, to refinance, then that gives you a lot more flexibility. And uh, the mortgage market index, um, uh, 
is as Keith I think mentioned before, pretty much the lowest ever. It's not a not a good time to be mm. taking out uh, a mortgage. A mortgage purchase index, a very similar story. Um, that's come off from 300 to, in fact, it, it had halved to 150 a month or so ago. There's now about 170. But again, pretty, pretty much the same picture of it's a painful time to take out a mortgage. Uh, the US Johnson Redbook retail sales year on year. Now, I'm assuming this must be in nominal dollars. Um, it's yes. still expanding. But uh, you know, if, you, if you're expanding at 3%, but inflation is seven eight then obviously um in volume terms you you're you're actually down uh four percent or so um uh, if you're a retailer yeah and the trend is definitely coming down uh building permits are much like the i mean the, the, this one very much surprised me i could sort of see why if you were a builder you're, you're, you're going through your inventory you're, you're flogging new homes at a discount if necessary to get them off your books but why are building permits bouncing? I mean, mm. you're not just running off the, the old permits. You're, you're actually taking out new ones. It's um, very yeah. unexpected. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Animal spirits still exist in the um, U.S. construction market. Really surprising. Yeah. I mean, to, to get a lower mortgage rate in the future, that's predicated on there, there being you know, a recession and rates coming down. And a recession, mm. obviously, you would think generally not good for wages not good for animal spirits well it also bear in mind Stuart, that all these numbers are now historic and in order to build all this residential and commercial stuff you need financing and the question yeah. is are the u.s banks still going to be lending we just don't know seems unlikely doesn't it uh, right, so this is looking at new home sales, new home sales, not just all uh, home sales, and that's where you can see that there's been uh, a bit of a bounce. Um, uh, so I presume that's was that six hundred thousand in a month. Uh, that's the annualized rate. Yeah, annualized. Oh yes, yes, the American way. They often annualize yeah. short-term numbers. Yeah. Initial jobless claims. Well, um, it's it's been true for months, hasn't it? That there's really very little evidence in the labor market of uh, of a coming recession it remains pretty strong so initial jobless claims um uh was that about 190 which is roughly what it's been for the past mm. last year yeah now we're getting a lot of commentary about how unemployment claims are rising in various states but frankly in the aggregate numbers you're just not seeing it and similarly, in the continuing jobless claims, I mean, perhaps you might see a slight uptrend in those numbers if you wanted to, but mm. it's difficult to see a, a big change there. And obviously, the big question is, is joblessness um, a lagging or a leading indicator? And given that the hoarding of labour that um, uh, has been commented on a lot, the suspicion, of course, is that it's a, a lagging indicator. And here's the evolution of the Atlanta Fed's GDP now estimate. And... Um, you know, basically upwards and upwards. Uh, if there's weakness, it's not at the moment. Um, so uh, the annual quarterly percentage change, seasonally adjusted, now estimated to be a bit over 3%. So um, for the moment, um, the growth continues. Absolutely. Now turning to the UK, um, here's the growth in number of payrolled employees year on year. So still actually some increase. Um, to, to that extent, there's a similarity with the states. Um, it's more to that about two and a half percent, but but mm. still actual growth in, in employment. Yeah. And turning to some leading indicators, these are from the the conference board, and um, here, this uh, we are trying to look ahead rather than looking at the, the lagging indicators like employment, and this does look worrying. Uh, I don't can't remember what's included in this uh, leading indicator, but. Um, that's it's not at a good time, not at a good point. Yeah, the thing is, it does have a very good history of correctly predict predicting recessions. But in this case, I mean, we're seeing this difference between the leading indicators and the contemporaneous data, which is just persisting. Previously, when the leading indicator has fallen below certain point, you're really expecting a recession imminently. And we're just not getting it. And, uh, you know, we've seen the uh, employment numbers and they're not showing an uptick. So I don't know. Yeah. And looking at that uh, on a year over year basis, 
um, basic, and then aligning that with GDP. Uh, again, you, you see, as Keith has been talking about, that normally this is a very good indicator of, of recession, but uh, it's not there yet. Yeah. So uh, in summary, uh, UK inflation rose in February. Very bad news. Uh, beat expectations of a slight fall in the rate of price increases. Um, still tough times in the UK. Uh, there was a surprisingly strong number in US home sales. Um, the housing market is surprisingly resilient. And the US job market uh, is also remaining tight. And US retail sales um, look like they're falling, at least on a unit or a volume basis, even if not yet on a price basis. Thanks, Stuart. OK, on to one chart. And what the um, Fed is doing is it is pumping money into the banking system in return for collateral, good quality collateral, i.e. government bonds. Now, reminder, if the value of the bond is, let's say, 70 in the market, it is lending to the banks par, so 100. So 70% of the money it's loaning to the banks will be backed by collateral and 30% will not. That's an unsecured loan. But in the background, the Fed is continuing to run down its balance sheet of bonds bought as part of the QE program. So in the background, QT continues. Now, is what the Fed's doing going to leak into the economy? So is the liquidity it's providing to banks going to lead to wider systemic liquidity? And I'd be interested in Stuart's thoughts here, but I think not. The banks are going to be attempting to shore up their balance sheets and increase their liquidity, and they're not going to be lending it out. However, if there's a run on the bank, then that money will be withdrawn and given to other banks or go into money market funds. And money market funds hold short-term commercial debt so there may be some extra liquidity provision provided to companies if they issue new debt but the majority of that will go into existing debt and so won't be new lending Stuart what are your thoughts well in truth I'm no expert in this area and I do get myself confused with all the all the different measures I know there's a chart been going around um, the internet this week about the uh, level of lending at the Fed's deposit window being at a mm. record amount, record ever. Yeah. Other people saying, look, that, that's just one part of it and you've got to look at, at everything. T -t to me, there's, there's this constant ongoing blurring about what is QE uh, and what is just helping a market function and operate. Mm. And it, it's a sort of shades of grey where when you get something like this latest um fed facility to take on you know, the hold to maturity um bonds at par you, you, you are sort of just helping a market function but you're, you're you're blurring what the accounting is telling you it's going to be very opaque i assume how much individual banks have taken advantage of this mm. but i suspect i suspect you're right that on a behavioral basis and, and given the cyclical outlook banks will not be looking to, to to lend out what they've borrowed they'll be using it mm. you know, for liquidity provision and to improve their ratios but strategically i mean here we go again isn't it with yeah. the central banks yeah. sort of finding ways to not apply the rules and finding ways to, to plaster over mm. problems and again i don't fully understand um all how all these things work but my suspicion is that you know, we are um you know, we're not letting a few trees burn, so um, we're protecting that. And the risk is that one day the whole forest goes down. Um, it's, yeah, I can understand why they do it, but that something doesn't feel right. We, we can't just keep papering over things. Yeah, and basically, whenever there's a problem, the default is to pump more money into the system. Uh, so on to Inflation Watch, and uh, as we've been covering, uh, the UK number is here in in the table. Um, awful. 
um, if we look at, at Germany, where we've had a, an update, uh, CPI 8.7%. Um, so that's the context against which we should look at that Eurozone wage growth, which I think was more like 5.5%. Uh, and Japan, um, awful numbers there, um, CPI 4.3%. And I'm here in Japan at the moment. I would say that this is the place showing the greatest creativity with shrinkflation as well. Um, the, the size of my beer glass has definitely shrunk over the past year while prices are, have remained level. Mm. Well, it's going to be very interesting to see what happens in Japan because you know, they're continuing to do absolutely enormous QE and suppress the yield curve. So if yep. you could get runaway inflation, couldn't you? I mean, if interest rates rise on the debt then the uh, government goes bust very quickly, doesn't it? Well, it does. Um, it's been an accident waiting to happen for many, many, many years. Uh, one of the commentators that I um, I read, he took out a Japanese yen mortgage. Um, he's, he's based in the US. But he did that because he thought at some point the, the yen would have to turn to toilet paper because mm. the, the, the printing creating so much. And it might be that we're at that tipping point because... Uh, previous bouts of Japanese inflation have been sort of um, import or commodity-led price increases. But now you're beginning to see some examples of domestic sort of demand pull inflation uh, mm. on the back of finally and at last um, wage increases for Japanese employees. So possibly, you know, if you're getting that demand pull inflation and um, the new governor of the Bank of Japan allows the 10-year bonds to... to uh, float and be set by more like a market rate maybe we'll we're going to reach that um crescendo and if we don't reach it in um the bond market then presumably the currency continues to weaken that that's mm. you know, where the where the you know the, the squeeze in the balloon has to appear and that of course is inflationary yeah certainly for a country that has to import a lot of its food and its energy that's going to be yeah. painful uh, right. So turning to um, some of the components of the UK inflation problem, here is CPIH, which is the measure that I think um, the um, Office of National Statistics would like us to be looking at. Uh, that in the dotted line and in the unbroken line is the inflation at restaurants and hotels. So you could argue this is you know, perhaps one place where if there's going to be inflation, at least it's voluntary. It's not food mm. that people have got to buy. At least this is you know, people who are deciding to, to go to restaurants and hotels. Uh, and there we're seeing 12% inflation in contrast to the about 9% on the CPIH measure. And presumably that's driven by you know, the cost of labour and the availability of labour. Also energy costs, Stuart, and think that um, businesses are not subsidised as much as consumers. So they're more exposed to the rise in energy prices. Good point. And uh, one of the areas where um, the inflation problem is most acute and has got a lot of coverage is the very high level of inflation for food and non-alcoholic beverages. Um, that, that's approaching 20% year on year mm. inflation in, in that category. I mean, that's simply nosebleed level. Yeah. Transport and motor fuels. Well, here, I, I guess we're seeing the, the gradual effect of the, the fall in uh, oil and gas prices. So th this is one area where um, it's lower than average inflation. Um, the, there had been a story that inflation was emerging more in services rather than in goods. But, you know, that's not really the case. It, it, it's yeah. pretty broad based. Um, so, yes, it, it's worse in goods, but it hasn't been particularly falling over or rolling over. And um, services um, is picking up. So uh, it, it's difficult to find any pockets of, uh, of good news. Yeah, grim. Uh, looking at the, the breakdown um, in terms of more components, clothing and footwear was particularly painful. Um, this is the month on month change up 2.6%, uh, followed closely by seasonal food, unprocessed food and processed food and non-seasonal food. So you get the picture. Mm. And it's only at the other end uh, of energy and vehicle fuels that there was any falls. But, you know, rises of 2.5% on a month for things like food, it's yeah. pretty painful, pretty noticeable. And it's just so broad-based. 
I mean, basically yeah. almost everything apart from fuel is rising. And uh, th I think one of the most depressing aspects of this is that the UK is performing worse um, compared to the US and the Eurozone, where it's more clear that there's been a rolling over and the, the rate of increases is slowing. Um, not so in the UK. Yes, just, just on that, Keith, I mean, I, I'm so old fashioned about this that uh, I noticed that the pound had a bit of a bump on this bad inflation data on the mm. assumption that, you know, interest rates would have to go up. But I mean, I'm old fashioned. You know, the fact that you get another quarter of a cent a year in interest when your purchasing power is, is declining so painfully quickly mm. strikes me as a sort of a, a nonsense. It's financial markets looking to, to make quick bets. Um, but from an investor perspective, it, it makes me you know, want to make sure I'm very globally diversified and uh, don't actually have too much uh, um, pound exposure. Yeah, I completely agree with that, Stuart. Uh, if we look at the ECB food and non-energy industrial goods, um, the forecasts here are for an easing of uh, pipeline pressures uh, in pan-European uh, inflation. Now, I'm very hopeful that uh, if food prices fall in the Eurozone, then they also fall in the UK and they are forecast to really fall sharply starting in Q3. Uh, turning to the US and the Cleveland Fed inflation forecasts, um, I think that the important number here is, is highlighted in the red dot where the, the inflation forecast for core CPI year over year uh, for March is now 5.7%. And that, I think, would be a reasonably good number. Um, I think that the issue, the difficulty for the Fed will come when we're at sub 4% inflation. And if uh, uh, unemployment is rising, then it's going to face the dilemma between its two different mandates. Mm. Well, core CPI, Stuart, they're forecasting it will rise from its current 5.5% to 5.7% in March. But CPI will fall sharply. So not altogether great. Uh, US trueflation, however, uh, this is a sign of, um, uh, I think they cal calculated in one of the old fashioned ways is uh, just 4% uh, and falling. Be interesting to know the composition of that to see how they've uh, produced that. Well, actually, that uses um, contemporaneous data, you know, so from the internet, etc. So live prices, you know, so many prices are now available online, you can get a decent idea of what the economy is doing. And that is what Trueflation tried to do. Uh, it's not the old measure recreated. It's um, no. yeah, actually a much more modern you know, uh, sort of thousand million prices. Yeah. Uh, for the UK, however. <laughs> yeah. It's always the, always the UK. And here we go. So about 17 percent. It's miserable. Yeah, I'm not sure about their UK measure. We're reporting it. But you see these big jumps. They su yeah. That suggests they've got this over-reliance on, you know, our monthly data. Now, here we're showing some um, historic comparisons, um, looking at trends in inflation across various historical periods back to the 40s. And the, I think the idea here is that, yes, it's bad, but it's going to get better, um, which might be comforting. But at the back of my mind, I've got um, Keith's model of you know, perhaps the 1970s stop go situation mm. where, yes, OK, perhaps in 18 months inflation will be seemingly back to a more comfortable level. But have the structural pressures on inflation really eased or are, are we in a stop go world and it'll be back? I think it'll be back, but I think that it's going to be very volatile. So the trouble is, Stuart, that all these numbers we're reporting, they're now historic. And you know, have we essentially had a Minsky moment in the form of a an emerging financial crisis? And you know, we're recording this before the market opens on Friday morning. You know, by the time I publish this this could already be out of date. I mean, the CDS on Deutsche Bank are rising rapidly. So if banks pull in their horns and stop lending in order to, put, to uh, protect their balance sheets, then, you know, you can see a uh, rapid recession. Yes, unfortunately, that's all too possible, isn't it? We're in a world where you know, snowflakes on snowballs cause avalanches, possibly. Mm. So in summary, UK inflation, as we, we keep on about, uh, is broad-based, persistent and high. 
Um, the ECB is forecasting food inflation should fade rapidly from here, though. Uh, US trueflation uh, suggests that price pressures are falling um, in the States, uh, but the Cleveland Fed is forecasting that inflation has fallen to 5.2% in March uh, from 6% in February. Again, if true, that would be reasonably reassuring for the States. Yes, but you notice that they were saying that CPI, which includes energy prices, is falling, whereas core CPI, which doesn't, is rising. And again, the Cleveland Fed is essentially saying that inflation in services is persistent, which is not great news. Thanks, Stuart. On to Recession Watch. So the UK is forecast to be the worst performing economy in the G7. So the UK seems to be reverting to its 1970s problem of stagflation. We have persistent inflation and we ain't doing so well on the growth. Now, the big question is, what happens now? Are financial conditions going to tighten? Now, if you look at the Goldman Sachs Financial Conditions Index, well, it hasn't really got worse. The Bloomberg one has. But all these financial conditions indices should be taken with a pinch of salt because they use market prices such as CDS, high yield bond prices and VIX. And therefore, they're more a reflection of risk appetite that than credit conditions for bank lending. So we'll go through these. This is the Chicago Fed's National Financial Conditions Index. It is not showing signs of stress. You'll see that during the pandemic, it did. But right now, still actually pretty good. So, but historically, banking crises tend to be followed by tighter lending standards. And lending standards were already tightening before the failure of Silicon Valley Bank. Expect banks to pull in their horns, reduce lending, increase the rates they charge for loans and attempt to protect their balance sheet and increase their cash holdings. Now, GavCal Economics claim that they have a better index of financial conditions and theirs has deteriorated very rapidly to conditions that are worse than during the great financial crisis. I struggle to believe this, frankly, but we do know that lending conditions have tightened and all these numbers are from pre the failure of Silicon Valley Bank and then the banks were tightening their lending conditions for commercial and industrial, commercial real estate, and only to an extent residential mortgages. But the economy seemed to be surviving pretty well despite the tightening credit conditions. Fund managers are worried about credit and counterparty risk. Now, the RSM Financial Conditions Index Again, not really showing much sign of stress. The TED spread, which looks at the price that banks are lending to each other versus US treasuries. Well, and you're looking at the yellow bars at the bottom, actually not that elevated currently. And this shows bank lending in the US. And you see that small banks have been reducing their lending, whereas large banks, it's been more stable. But you can see that large banks these days produce less credit than the small banks do because they were more heavily regulated after the great financial crisis. Keith, have a look at the composition of those bars. The, the blue bar, uh, the blue component in the left-hand side, representing commercial real estate, very heavy for the regional banks, the small ones, barely present for the large banks on the right. Very good point, Stuart. And bankruptcy cases have been artificially suppressed by fiscal and monetary largesse during the pandemic. And it suggests there are a lot of zombie companies in the US that 
the current funding stress is going to push into insolvency and that will place further stresses on the banking system. US GDP forecasts have risen recently, but are still forecasting a recession, sorry, a contraction in Q2. Although the Citigroup Economic Surprise Index continues to surprise the upside, data as of the 17th. But when you look at the Michigan survey, that is rolling over. So buying conditions for vehicles falling again, durable goods falling. Interesting that US consumers now think that their current financial conditions versus five years ago is not great, despite all the pandemic stimulus that pumped um, consumer bank accounts full. And US credit card spending is starting to fall. And if you look at imports, like container imports, they're falling quite sharply. So how strong is the US consumer? We know that employment in the US is being supported by lots of new business creation. Now, if there's a credit crunch, who is going to fund those new businesses? I also wonder how many of them are, are one-man bands. You, know, you set up your own consultancy, yeah. something like that. And so far, initial jobless claims have done nothing. But warn notices are rising rapidly. Reminder, warn notices are when an employer plans to lay off a large number of people and it has to tell the authorities in advance by, I think, six weeks. So the warn notices will lead unemployment. And if you look at job postings, well, everywhere in all sectors, they're coming down. So you should see unemployment start to rise in the coming months as the economy slows. So in summary, a lot, everything we're reporting really is uh, historic data. What matters now is, are we entering a credit crunch? Will the failure of Credit Suisse, Silicon Valley Bank, et cetera, lead to tighter lending standards and therefore reduced growth? The Measures we've reported of financial conditions really show what conditions are like in markets. They don't report what the banks are intending to do, whether they're going to increase their lending and at what rate. So we're just going to have to wait and see. Now, a new section. Is it the right time to buy gold? And a special thanks to Knight3001 for suggesting uh, this topic. So... Uh, Gold has been doing really rather well over the past few weeks. Um, have a look at this, this chart here. The, the gold price has risen from just above $1,800 an ounce to about $1,980. So um, it's been one area of, of price strength in, uh, in troubled markets. That's the, the recent story. And this is a, a, an attempt to look at the seasonality of the performance of gold which suggests that January, April and June are good times to, to buy gold. I'm not sure that this is more than statistical. I'm not sure there's you know, some uh, underlying logic, mm. but that's that's what the story is statistically. Yeah. So we're going through um, various measures to look, see you know, whether gold is the right time to buy gold. And what, it, the, what you notice is that over the 30-year period between 1986 and 2016, you know, gold every year on average was going up. Now you can try and time that, you know, but in general, gold has been a good investment over that period. And looking at uh, seasonality um, with a detrended analysis, I assume the previous chart was was including that that uptrend you just referred to. Uh, suggests that July is um, the right time, or at least uh, through the summer. September also looks pretty good uh, to me mm. from this chart. Okay, now here's um, an attempt to look more cyclically at what's the right time to buy different asset classes. And it's relating the performance of US stocks, the US dollar, and gold 
to the timing of rate hikes. And the suggestion here is that a, a rate hike is the right time to, to be buying gold and that one can hope for pretty good performance over the next six months. So this presumably is rates up, economy down, rush into gold as, as a safe haven. Yeah, I was very surprised by this, actually. So my prejudice would have been rising rates bad for gold because, you know, the cost of funding your gold position rises. And you expect um, people to be selling gold and buying assets which um, with rising returns, such as um, bonds. OK, so there's a, a big, long debate about the relationship between gold and, and interest rates. So the common idea is that um, as interest rates rise, uh, gold will perform poorly because of those, those costs um, of you know, the, the opportunity cost of holding gold. However, um, during the late 70s, that really wasn't true. Rates were going up, inflation was going up, and gold did very, uh, did very well. So to me, this, this suggests really it, it's about a broader context of um, mm -hmm. what phase or regime uh, you're in and what the, the prime motivations that investors have. Is it um, you know, asset protection? Is it um, short-term speculation? And I would think in those different regimes, you, the response to interest rates would be different. Yeah. Is it fear? You know, yeah. If, yeah. If, it, if investors are fearful about the future and the monetary system, you rush to gold. So over the past 25 years, um, this relationship between gold and real U.S. Treasury yields has looked pretty good. Well, particularly since you know, perhaps 2006 to about um, 2020. Uh, you have, have a look at the chart here. So again, low rates, gold does OK. Higher rates, um, gold does poorly. However, if we look at the right hand side of the chart in a bit more detail, that relationship has weakened somewhat over the past couple of years. Yeah. So gold has done much better than you might expect. Yes, because you can get what 1% real on a, on a tip now. So you would mm. think that would be the safe haven um, asset of choice. Uh, right. Trying to look at things on a more technical basis. Here is the um, moving averages over a long time period, uh, the 10 month and 52 month moving averages. And gold has broken out um, well above those momentum lines. So presumably that's a, that's a, a good sign if you're, a, if you're a chartist. And looking at that on a more short term basis, the 10 day and 52 day moving averages. Well, again, um, that they, it's broken through both of those lines, in fact, very sharply. Now, you notice it did the same in March, though. And, <laughs> you know. Yeah. Right. Um, so back to Keith's point about, about fear and, and different regimes, um, gold does tend to do well during equity bear markets, as long as those equity bear markets are not accompanied by overly strong rises in, in interest rates. So um, here we, the, we show different performance at uh, different time periods of the S&P doing poorly and having a look at uh, the performance of gold and silver. You can see with, with one major exception, the, the early 80s, uh, gold tended to do well as the S&P 500 did poorly. So presumably this is a run for the hills type motivation. And possibly that early 80s one is an exception. I think. Is that the fallout after the Hunt brothers had tried to corner the silver market? Perhaps there was a spillover into gold from, from that. Yeah, very good spot, Stuart. Right. So um, one of the more interesting arguments for gold, I think, is the, the correlation argument. We're all supposed to build portfolios which are robust to different um, different regimes. And here the, we show the correlation of gold to uh, uh, various different asset classes, including uh, U.S. REITs, cash, uh, U.S. treasuries, investment grade bonds, high yield bonds, and U.S. equities, where, you know, plus or minus, the, the correlation is basically zero. So it's um, a reasonably useful uh, cor uh, uncorrelated asset. It's not heavily negatively correlated, but it, it is at least uncorrelated. The exception, of course, is the correlation with commodities more broadly. Um, and again, I think you could think about that as being a 1970s phenomenon of mm. just buy any real asset to preserve your purchasing power.
Um, a rather more complicated chart here. Um, so this, I think, is similar to the idea of the, the previous table looking at the performance of gold uh, compared to equity bear markets, because this is looking at gold compared to recessions. Um, and again, you, you do see uh, gold offering some um, protection in, in, in that case, in that context. Having said that, it looks like you, you know you're beginning to get a sense of you know, when's the right time to buy gold, which is you know, when there's a, when there's a crisis, when the equity markets are doing poorly, when there's a recession. However, there's always an exception, and um, I think Keith has pointed out this issue before, um, which is that sometimes you have to sell what you can sell. And during the global financial crisis, gold did not perform the um, safe haven uh, role and function that you would have thought. Uh, actually, gold fell 30% as the stock market crashed. It did thereafter rally hard. So mm. you've got to think about your, your holding period and what you're holding it for. But it's not going to give you protection um, during every, uh, every market sell-off. Now, this, this chart surprised me. This is having a look at the uh, flows um, into gold ETFs. And they've actually been quite weak over the past couple of years, which... Given that the gold price has been flat and then up, um, that has a, did somewhat surprise me. Perhaps people are you know, literally holding gold in vaults and they don't want to hold it mm. in um, in paper ETF form. Now, one thing which has attracted a lot of interest, particularly since the war in Ukraine, is the issue of central banks and their holdings of gold. And um, we can see here that actually, since about 2010, central banks ha have been reasonably steadily buying gold. And then that went, um, that, that reached record levels uh, last year. And I think, again, this is the issue of, well, if the West is going to freeze or even expropriate um, uh, paper or financial assets, um, some central banks are going to look to, to gold and physically owning, controlling um, where they hold that gold. Yeah, so this is from our Discord member, Simon W., who is good at technical analysis, and frankly, neither Stuart or I are. So I think if you want to understand what's going on, frankly, you need to join the Discord, and there is a channel there on technical analysis, and Simon and other people can explain what's going on. But bottom line is he thinks that if GLD, which is the Spot Gold Trust, and he's done this analysis on that rather than the gold price that breaks above 185, then it has potential upside to 220, and it is very close to 185. So, thank you for that, Keith. That's <laughs> exactly so. Um, uh, here is is that the importance of that particular level of the gold price because you can see um, the recent uh, couple of weeks sharp increase in the gold price has brought it brought the price up to a level that it's failed to break out from in the past. Hence, I, why I guess the logic is if it can break out this time, then it'll take a, a reasonably big step up from there. Yes, I thought this was rather good, Keith. Um, stop and, and have a look. Um, whilst we are throwing paper money around other countries are getting their hands on something physical, gold. The previous uh, collection of slides has been different ways to look at uh, gold, uh, some technical measures, some measures related to the economic cycle, the market cycle, interest rate cycle, to try to, to come up with a, a view. Now, if you run through most of these, these different indicators, on average, they, they are saying buy, I would say. Yes. So in conclusion, buy, although of course it would have been better to have got that, uh, got that in a couple of weeks ago. Um, I think more importantly, and this is the, the thing which I'm doing, is you buy and you hold for the duration of a financial crisis and a recession or a recession, whichever is longer. If that's the function of gold in your portfolio, to be an insurance against a financial crisis or particularly a monetary crisis, uh, then hold it for that reason, and you're not looking to trade out of it, even if it does very well. Mm -hmm. Now, quick reminder, this is not investment advice. Please do your own research and take responsibility for your own investment analysis and decisions. A full disclaimer can be found at the end. Thanks, Stuart. Okay, the big question at the moment is, are we going to have a banking crisis? 
And we have a couple of important sections on that coming up. So the first question is, why did Silicon Valley Bank go bust? Now, these are the BAL3 capital requirements. And the BAL3 um, regulations state that banks have to hold regulatory capital of at least 8% of their risk-weighted assets. Now, most banks are well above that. The part I want you to concentrate on is the core tier one equity. And that comprises common shares and retained earnings and is the capital that is most at risk. So if a bank gets into trouble, it should lose first its core equity tier one. It should then lose the AT1s. So tier one gets right. So core equity tier one gets wiped out first, then AT1, then T2. When a bank buys assets or securities in the market, it has to designate them immediately on purchase, whether it is HTM or AFS. Now, HTM is hold to maturity. If it puts those assets in the hold to maturity basket, they are not marked to market. They stay on the books of the bank at the price that they bought them. If it's asset for sale, those securities are marked to market. But if the bank ever sells anything from its hold to maturity basket, then the entirety of those assets are marked to market, crystallizing losses. If that happens and losses are crystallized, remember that in tier one, your capital includes retained earnings and you've just re um, crystallized the loads of losses. So the capital of the bank falls and that may put the bank in breach of BAL3 capital requirements. That does not necessarily make the bank insolvent. It just has to raise additional capital or reduce its loan book to get back within the BAL3 requirements. So what happened to Silicon Valley Bank is that they had borrowed money during last year to the tune of $15 billion from the Federal Home Loan Bank of San Francisco, pledging $19 billion in assets as collateral. And they had the capacity to borrow more. And if they'd done that, they could potentially have fixed their liquidity problems without having to crystallize losses on the HTM portfolio. And reminder, it was crystallizing those losses that alerted the market to the poor state of the balance sheet and led to the run on the bank. So they could potentially have avoided the whole thing by taking more money from the San Francisco Federal Home Loan Bank. But they didn't because the money from the Federal Home Loan Bank was at a rate of 4.17% compared to the 1.79% they were receiving on their hold to market portfolio. Reminder, Silicon Valley Bank got a load of money from VCs, et cetera, during the pandemic. And then it invested that at the low interest rates available during the pandemic. So its hold to market portfolio was very low yielding. And so if it had taken more money from the Federal Home Loan Bank, then it would have solved the liquidity crisis, but it would have been borrowing money at much higher interest rates than it was receiving. And so it would have solved the liquidity prices, but it would then have had a profitability slash solvency crisis. So in summary, the banks in the US are sitting on massive unrealized losses in their loan books and securities portfolios. If those losses are crystallized by marking the portfolio to market, then those banks will sit face a solvency crisis requiring them to raise more capital or to go bust.
But if they attempt to keep their whole to maturity portfolio untouched, not crystallize those losses and borrow money from the Fed, then the money from the Fed comes at much higher interest rates and they will face a profitability crisis. And on to banks. Banking crisis could affect the economy through four channels. Payment system disruptions, we're seeing no evidence of that yet. And there's no reason as yet that should occur unless we have massive bank failures. Lower output from financial service companies, well, that's quite a small part of the economy. And again, there's no evidence of that yet. Negative wealth effects, well, we've seen that the prices for financial assets such as equities are falling. So that will be an effect. But the big one is tighter credit. And we don't know yet, but it's likely that banks, having seen the failures of Silicon Valley Bank and Credit Suisse, will now be attempting to protect the viability of their banks by strengthening their balance sheet, reducing loan provision and increasing their liquidity provision. Now, we've shown this chart before, but every time interest rates rise, something breaks. And the speed with which the Fed and central banks around the world have increased interest rates has been very fast by historic standards. That's project that produces a lot of stress on the financial system. And we are now seeing some of the symptoms of that stress. And if you look at bank failures by year, by the value of deposits in those failing banks, then 2023 is already the worst year in history for US bank failures. And bank stocks have fallen as interest rates have risen because the market is concerned about the effect of rising rates on the profitability of US banks, which is rather against what you might have expected. Because what we've previously said is that rising rates are good for banks because it increases their interest rate spread between the money, what they're paying depositors and what they're receiving on their longer term loans. But this crisis is different because of the very low rates that banks were able to achieve during the pandemic, and therefore the low rates they have in their hold to maturity loan book. The way I think about it is that the, there's a sort of profit and loss effect, and there's a balance sheet effect. And the profit and loss effect of higher rates should be good news, but the it's being swamped by the balance sheet effect where um, the value of the assets on the balance sheet has been crippled by the, the big changes in, in interest rates. Yes, thank you, Stuart. That's a very good way of analysing the problem. So this is the price of US banks as measured by various indices. The red line is the bank index. The yellow line is the regional bank index. And you'll see that they haven't really recovered despite the uh, interventions of the Fed to um, put Silicon Valley Bank into bankruptcy and then, but, de de but protect the depositors. And they're falling again yesterday. Now on Stuart's point, the net interest margin of banks has recovered. So their profitability has improved with rising interest rates. And the reason their profitability is improved is that they have not been passing those higher rates on to their depositors. And you'll see the green line is the deposit rate, which is barely 0.5%, whereas the Fed funds rate is now 4.75%. So that is their spread. And as a result, depositors have been taking their money out and putting their money into money market funds, which have a much higher yield. And that flight to money market funds seems to be accelerating. As Stuart said earlier, if you take your money out of the bank and put it in a money market fund, 
it is protected from the insolvency of the bank. So that is another reason. You get a higher yield and better, better protection. It is no wonder money is leaving the banking system. Keith, just, just one smaller aside on that. Um, but a Warren Buffett point and Warren Buffett's story is um, if you compare a bank to an insurance company, an insurance company similar to a bank is using other people's deposits, other people's money to make investments. But the difference is in the insurance company, you've got a very good idea of when you've got to pay that money back, i.e. When, when claims are likely to happen. The mm. trouble with a bank is that it's incredibly flighty. So you can't use the deposits uh, as the as the float um, is used in an insurance company because it gets with it can be withdrawn just so quickly. Yeah, no, well, very good point, Stuart. Particularly in this digital age, where you know you can just log on to your banking app and move all your money instantly. So it's almost like Warren Buffett knows what he's doing. <laughs> so this is data from the eighth of March and. Even that's so before the failure of Silicon Valley Bank. And you see that over the previous year, that deposits in US banks had fallen by, what's that, about 8%. And last week, so data not included in those previous charts, saw a huge flow out of banks into money market funds. As a result of which, the loans deposit ratio is rising because deposits are falling although this data is for large banks Keith, just just one other little thing um one nuance in all this is the difference between a loan and a fixed income asset uh, mm. for the banks which i think is quite important in terms of which banks are vulnerable silicon valley bank had so much of its um of its assets in fixed interest um securities or albeit treasuries whereas many banks will have put their deposits into loans and loans are typically floating rate so they're more naturally hedged to an increase mm. in interest rates and that was one of the reasons svb was just eviscerated because yeah. it was in these mm. you know, can you imagine you're buying a 10-year bond at you know one and a half two percent um it's uh, it's obviously collapsed yeah absolutely but banks in the US are much better capitalized than they were during the great financial crisis, particularly the large banks. Although that does not account for the massive losses they're sitting on their securities and loan books. So if you were to net off their, these losses against their capital, then how much of the capital is actually illusory and what is the true state of the banking system if you look at um so that should be bank of america rather than bank of england if you look at bank of america then actually unrealized losses would take out 60 percent of its book value Keith, perhaps there was a little Freudian slip there. Perhaps you did mean the Bank of England. And, uh, <laughs> all well, the ones it's bought. <laughs> I clearly have the Bank of England on my mind, yes. Yeah. And after the great financial crisis, obviously the large banks in the US, the systemically important banks, were subject to a great deal of regulation, which the smaller regional banks were not. And that's one of the reasons that Silicon Valley Bank was able to get into the trouble it did. Uh, but as a result of that, the large regulated banks have reduced their credit provision and the smaller, less regulated banks have increased it. And now a larger portion of credit provision in the US. So this chart shows the loss to equity ratios of various US banks. And you see the First Republic Bank, which is one of the ones which has been subject to um, scares in the market, is up there. But there are other banks in similarly bad situations. And a problem for the banks in the US is going to be their loans to commercial real estate. And one thing that 
that the pandemic has done is permanently change worker behavior and they are now not going to the office as much as they did you see that office visits are down 40 percent over a three-year period and that means that the market is concerned about vacancy rates and rents for commercial real estate and offices in particular and the banks are responsible for originating a lot of those loans. If we look at vacancy rates before the pandemic and now, they've risen everywhere. And the regional banks have a lot of exposure to that market. So this chart shows by bank real estate loans as a percentage of all loan types. And pause, take a look. This goes through bank by bank and shows their exposure to the commercial real estate section. And small banks have dangerously low levels of reserve cash. They're low on liquidity. How will the banks, banks react is the big question. The lesson from the failure of Silicon Valley Bank and Signature Bank is that they need to boost their liquidity their cash levels to accommodate a run on the bank and that means cutting exposure to illiquid loans so not increasing the loan book increasing cash by taking money from the fed and generally tightening underwriting standards to uh, strengthen the bank balance sheet and increase their capital ratios but the effects of those actions will be to reduce credit provision into the economy, which will worsen a coming recession. But also by taking money from the Fed, they will be reducing their own profitability and potentially swapping a liquidity crisis for a solvency crisis. We look at the banks in the US and their the percentage that were tightening lending standards for various categories and this all data from the st louis fed you will see that even prior to silicon valley bank going bust they were tightening lending standards so this is loan provisions to large and medium uh, commercial industrial firms to small firms to credit cards auto loans commercial real estate so Every, every category is seeing tighter lending standards. But in aggregate, there has been good commercial loan growth in the US over the past year, which has supported economic growth and the resilience we've been seeing in the US economy. If that goes negative now, then economic growth will weaken. And small banks now account for the majority of loans to commercial and industrial enterprises. So if we look at U.S. banks by size, so here we're looking at the left-hand chart and the x-axis is the size of the bank by assets. And you'll see that small banks now account for just under half of all commercial and industrial lending. The big bar on the right is banks with more than 250 billion in assets. So that's the big banks and they're re responsible for just over half, smaller banks for the remainder. If you look at residential lending, then small and medium-sized banks now account for 60% of residential lending. And for 80% of total commercial real estate lending. So they have a huge role in the economy. And this is consumer loans, again, 45%. So if small banks now have to strengthen their balance sheet, reduce lending, that will re result in a big reduction in loan provisions to small businesses in particular.
and commercial real estate. And that should result in a surge in unemployment if the historic relationship between loans to small businesses and unemployment holds. And loan growth was slowing even before the failure of Silicon Valley Bank. We've shown you this chart before, but money supply growth was already weak and negative, and that has only happened a few times in history, and all of those times have been associated with recessions. Now, we previously stated this time could actually be different because of the extraordinary uh, monetary largesse during the pandemic, and the negative money supply growth could simply be draining excess money from the system. Is this where we are? Has the failure of Silicon Valley Bank been analogous to Bear Stearns, i.e. the failure of Silicon Valley Bank was a symptom of underlying stress and let those stresses continue and as a result, you see further bank failures later. And on Stuart's point about run on the banks, mobile banking apps allow bank runs to happen pretty much instantaneously. And that is something that the banks are worried about. And they're going to in need to increase their liquidity to try and deal with the potential for further bank runs. It's, oh, oh, sorry, though, that's a fabulous chart, isn't it? A fabulous picture. <laughs> yes, this is what every central bank has to say, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Keith, sorry, just, just back on that previous point about uh, the banking apps and, and withdrawals being being very quick. I read a story in, in the week about how SVB had been trying to get more liquidity from the Fed, but the Fed's computers, they stop at four o'clock in the afternoon. So uh, they weren't able to process the request until the next day. Ah, uh, now the Fed is well aware of the potential for bank failures leading to tighter credit conditions. And I'm going to read this out. This is from Jerome Powell's speech at the FOMC press conference on Wednesday. Since our previous meeting, economic indicators have generally come in stronger than expected, demonstrating greater momentum in economic activity and inflation. We believe, however, that events in the banking system over the past two weeks are likely to result in tighter credit conditions for households and businesses, which would in turn affect economic outcomes. It is too soon to determine the extent of these effects and too soon to tell how monetary policy should respond. As a result, we no longer state that we anticipate that ongoing rate increases will be appropriate to quell inflation. Instead, we now anticipate some additional policy firming may be appropriate. And I think that is judicious. We just don't know, frankly. We'll have to wait and see how banks react and the extent to which they reduce credit provision. So in summary... We know that U.S. banks have very large mark-to-market losses on their existing loan book and bond holdings. And banks are experiencing heavy deposit outflows to higher yielding money market funds. Banks that are perceived to be in danger of insolvency can experience almost instantaneous bank runs and cash outflows that precipitates a crisis. So... Credit Suisse, Silicon Valley Bank, Signature Bank and others have already failed. There's heightened concern about the, the potential for further bank failures, which means that funding costs for banks are rising, as evidenced by their CDS, which we showed earlier. So banks are now going to have to be conservative. They're going to have to reduce loan provisions and hoard cash. And that will reduce credit provision in the economy and lead to a recession. And the, the banks most at risk are the smaller banks in the US that have been responsible for the majority of loan provisions and commercial enterprises and to offices. So bottom line is... There's likely to be a credit crunch. We don't know how bad it will be. Now, our concern 
is that Bear Stearns failed in March 2008 and proved to be a harbinger of deeper problems to come. The failures we've seen so far have all been before a credit crisis or a recession have really started. And as the economy slows, so you'd expect to see more business failures, more stress in the office market and loans that the banks have previously made failing, particularly to the office market. You could see a lot of banks which have made loans for office development, those developers failing and just handing the keys to the bank. Are we going to get a banking crisis analogous to the SNL crisis of the early 80s, where you just got serial bank failures over time as these loans go bad? So what are the asset allocation implications? Well, if we're going into a banking crisis, you just want to buy safe havens. So government bonds, gold, and you want to sell risk assets. So equities, commodities, high yield uh, bonds, corporate bonds, etc. So unfortunately, Stuart Owen has had to leave us. Now, I have also prepared lots of other segments, which frankly are queuing up because we are being overtaken by events in the market. I have a section on AT1s, which I wanted to do this week, but I'm afraid we don't have time for. I will attempt to do it next week. But on to other charts. Now, this is the UK's GDP per capita. And we are falling behind the rest of the G7 and alone amongst the G7, UK GDP is due to fall this year. Draw your own conclusions. From 20 up to 2016, UK and EU GDP per capita growth were in line. They have since diverged. And the poorest members of British society are suffering. Their life expectancy has actually been in decline. Now, earlier we showed you the chart of the U.S. Treasury General account, and the U.S. currently is at its debt ceiling. Now, you know that credit default swaps on U.S. government bonds are currently at about 70 basis points, and the market is concerned about a U.S. default if the two sides of Congress can't agree on an increase to the debt ceiling. Now, the US deficit is on an unsustainable path. And the question is, how will or will they rein in the deficit? Because this is the forecast path for US public debt, unless they start to deal with the deficit. So you can see a fight developing over the debt ceiling, but unless they really cut the deficit, then, then the debt is simply unsustainable. Now, turning to China, we have some charts on Chinese economy and it's doing better than um, last year, but still not great. These are restaurant bookings. The demand for homes has turned positive year on year, but really not by much. And if you look at floor space sold, it is still negative. International flights are picking up, but really not by much. So after all that, you need some good news. And this is from the FT this week, who were talking about a company called Loam Bio, and they have been re-engineering microbes so that they can provide carbon capture directly into the soil, which means that farmers have to use less fertilizer. They don't have to till the soil as much. And by boosting the amount of carbon, so organic 
compounds in the soil, you also increase moisture retention. So bioengineering has the possibility of making agriculture less chemically intensive and hence restoring some of the health of the soil and onto the weekly checklists and equity markets. And it was a pretty indifferent week. The all share was essentially flat downish. The S&P 500 closed down 40 basis points. The Hang Seng beat the trend up 2%. Bitcoin speculation is returning up 8.6% on the week, up 71% year to date. The dollar has had a bad week and sterling was up 1.3% versus the dollar, as was the euro, and the dollar index was down 1.4%. The possibility of banking crises in the US is undermining confidence in the dollar. VIX actually fell to 22.6. Reminder, you buy above 30, you sell below 20. So this is Bitcoin actually had a bounce this week, although well down from its highs. The NASDAQ showing some resilience. Equity bear markets are more common than you might expect. 20% drawdowns in the S&P 500 happen on average every four years. 25% drawdowns every 6.3 years. So if you can time the market, that's quite a lucrative strategy. The equity markets are volatile. This chart shows the outlook for US corporate earnings. And the blue line is historic earnings growth. And the solid yellow line is consensus forecast. Now, the dashed line is the leading indicator. So there's a big gap between consensus forecasts and leading indicators. So will the credit crunch lead to the market finally revising its earnings forecast be more in line with leading economic uh, indicators? And this chart shows that market breadth is deteriorating. The number of stocks hitting new lows is increasing once again. The number of stocks hitting new highs is falling. Not a good forecast for the uh, US equity markets. Uh, thank you for to draw it for sending us that. So the last chart showed you that US equity market breadth was deteriorating and US small caps are also not buying into this rally. So the yellow line is the Russell 3000. The purple line is the NASDAQ. And you see the Russell 3000 is underperforming. Fund manager cash allocations are rising again. Expect to see more of this as investors become more cautious. And on to commodities and energy commodities. Well, oil bounced a little bit this week, but is still down 12% on the year and showing no signs of sustained recovery. Thankfully, European natural gas prices continued to come off. So Dutch natural gas prices are down 5% on the week, as were the UK. US natural gas prices fell a further 14% and are down 50% on the year. Coal prices bounced a little bit, but still down almost 55% on the year. Uranium prices were up and were up 2.7% on the year, beating the rest of the energy complex. Some numbers specific to the oil market. Well, the US has gone back into inventory draws and a big inventory draw last week of 10.4 million barrels. So after a couple of months of inventory builds, is the US oil market now returning to being undersupplied? And that would be bullish for oil prices. US crude production ticked back up to um, 12.3 million barrels and the Baker Hughes count fell by one. So this is Brent and towards its lows for the year, although it's had a little tick up this week. 
Now, this is Russian crude exports by sea, and they're doing very well. Thank you very much. U.S. sanctions having no discernible effect. Global air travel remains strong, so consumers still have a strong appetite for travel after the years of lockdown and when travel was essentially banned. That's good for jet fuel demand and global petroleum inventories are falling again back into deficit bullish for oil prices. Now, U.S. oil and refined products exports have been relentlessly rising and are now almost 12 million barrels a day, which is absolutely astonishing. That's almost equal to the entirety of domestic production. So they must be importing a lot and re-exporting it. These are European natural gas futures continue to drift off. That's great news for European inflation and living standards. And gas storage is already starting to build in the US. That is early. These are UK natural gas futures, again, drifting down. US, new lows. Coal had a brief tick up, but well down on the year. Uranium, flat. On to industrial commodities. So a mixed week. Aluminium up a bit. Cobalt flat. Copper up 4% and up 8.1% year to date. And various commentators are warned warning of structural deficits in copper in the coming years and leading to much higher copper prices. Chromium drifted off. Iron ore has had a good start of the year, but fell 6.4% on the week. Lithium continues to fall and fall sharply, down 11% on the week, down almost 50% year to date. So the reduction in electric car subsidies in China has leading to fewer EV sales there and a big drop in lithium demand. Neodymium flat, nickel down on the week, down 26% year to date. Tin had a bit of a bounce, up 4%. Ferrovanadium followed iron ore down and zinc was pretty much flat. So this is aluminium towards its low for the year. Cobalt at its lows for the year. Copper actually showing resilience, bouncing back and towards its highs for the year. And reminder, demand for copper is going to keep on rising and we just haven't been investing in new supply. Unless we develop some new mines pronto, we're going to be in structural deficit in the coming years. Chromium drifting off. Iron ore. Is that a break in the trend? Has the iron market been too optimistic in its assumptions about Chinese demand? Lithium drifting off badly. Neodymium, nickel. And interesting story this week is that the LME have discovered that some of the bags in its warehouse that were, it thought, contained nickel, actually didn't contain nickel. They contained stones. Now, what's interesting is how the LME works. So when you buy a nickel contract from the LME, essentially the nickel is already stored in one of its warehouses and the ownership of that nickel then passes to you. So as long as nobody actually takes physical delivery of the nickel, then it doesn't actually, every, then everyone simply assumes that the nickel is there in the warehouse. And those bags of nickel can remain in the warehouse for many years unexamined. And so what's happened was that JP Morgan bought these bags of nickel years ago when they were already stored in Access World's Rotterdam warehouse. And now somebody has examined those bags 
and found they don't contain nickel. Now, JP Morgan are not accused of wrongdoing and neither is the LME. But the whole market works on trust and the assumption that those bags which are thought to contain nickel actually do. And as long as trust remains, people are happy to continue trading nickel on the assumption that those bags contain nickel. There's a tin. Uh, vanadium drifting off with the iron price and zinc on to precious metals and once again there has been a big divergence between the mo monetary metals and the commodity metals so gold was up 3.7 percent on the week up almost 10 percent year to date Silver also bounced up almost 6% on the week, but down 3.1% year to date. The rest of the precious metal complex continues to drift off. Platinum down 8.2% on the year. Rhodium collapsing down 32% on the year and almost 10% last week. Palladium down 20% on the year. So this is gold. So fears about the global Monetary system are leading to a flight to gold. Silver has reversed. Previously, it was following the commodity metals down. And it's now reversed and is following gold. Platinum down on the year, but had a good couple of weeks. Rhodium collapsing. Palladium collapsing. And on to rates. Well, both the Bank of England and the Fed raised rates by 25 basis points this week. So the UK bond market was upset by the rise in inflation in February, leading to rises across the curve, which have started to unwind yesterday when fears of a global banking crisis were renewed. So over the course of the week, the one-year yield rose by only seven basis points and actually falls, despite the rise in inflation, between the five-year and 20-year. Only the 50-year saw a small rise on the week. In contrast, in the eurozone, yields fell. So the market is more concerned about U UK inflation than it is about eurozone inflation. Now, <clears throat> reminder, whenever the Fed hikes, something breaks. And is it this time going to be small and regional banks? And the point about this chart is that the market is currently expecting interest rates to only come down a bit in the coming year and then rise again from late 2024 onwards. But history shows that actually during a crisis when a recession hits the fed cuts rates hard and fast and so the outlook for rates is probably asymmetric to the downside if there is a credit crunch and so this is the outlook for rates so Pre-Silicon Valley Bank, we have the red line. So markets were expecting interest rates to be cut actually into 2024, 25, and then recover. But the expectation was that there would not be substantial rate cuts. Now, as of the 20th of March, the cuts are expected to be more severe. This is the UK two-year reminder that UK inflation is currently 10.4%, so enormously negative in real terms. So the market is still expecting UK inflation to be to drop substantially by the end of the year. This is UK 10-year, 30-year, you know, towards its highs, frankly. This is US 10-year, German 10-year, Italian, Greek. OK, so um, I'm on the show this week, so I thought I'd update on my view of the different asset classes. Um, uh, Keith and Richard, as you know, are very cautious on all equities. I, however, um, 
am not too uh, not too worried about the world X US, basically based on, on valuation. Um, we know the US has outperformed for years. And if you look at long term valuation measures like CAPE, uh, cyclically adjusted pri uh, price earnings ratio, for instance, the US still looks awful to me. So I'm content to have a long term equity exposure um, for inflation hedging, for, for growth and for, in a sense, ignorance hedging, you know, just continue to, to hold an asset uh, asset class for the long term. But uh, I'd much rather buy the world X US. Uh, in fixed income land, um, the idea of, you know, a two year bond giving me four or five percent, that looks like a really a good place to, to hide out. I'm not as bold as Keith. I'm not able to buy 10, 20, 50 year bonds. Um, I, I look at UK inflation of 10, 12 percent and think, how can I own you know, a 10 year bond at four percent? I would much rather just hold a shorter term bond, um, pick up some income and have that as available liquidity. I can't make Keith sort of bold bet on, on rates falling. Uh, for gold, uh, for me, this isn't really about buy or sell. This is about having a strategic allocation to gold as a form of traditional insurance. So we can argue about what percentage that would be. It's not actually huge in, in my portfolio, but I don't think it's a traded asset for me. It's a sort of long-term insurance policy. Uh, industrial commodities, uh, it's not really my area, but I do have a sneaking sympathy for industrial commodities in a world of inflation. And I do hold a bit of the BlackRock World Mining Trust, um, partly because I like the, the dividends that the, the miners are throwing off given the uh, high commodity prices that there have been. Obviously, those prices have fallen quite a bit and you're not going to get the same profits and dividends. But there's a lot of capital discipline in the mining sector. And uh, I think we can see profitable prices and, and reasonable dividends from that, that sector. So as an inflation hedge, um, hedge against the 1970s type scenario, uh, I've got a sneaking desire to hold more industrial commodities. I don't hold much just that BlackRock World Mining Trust at the moment. Uh, energy commodities, um, similar idea. Uh, someone like Keith is prepared to, to play the cycle. I'm a bit more thinking, well, look, there's a structural undersupply um, of oil and um, given the, the lack of capex. So that just looks like it's going to get tighter and tighter um, over, over the next few years. And again, we're seeing all the capex discipline uh, one of the, 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 the tweaks I've got in that is that I prefer the, the US um, energy majors because I think that they're very hard headed and they're very good at the capital allocation uh, between dividends and share buybacks. So uh, I've got a US uh, oil majors ETF to, to give me that bet. Thanks, Stuart. Well, no change to my views. Concluding comments. Well, we're recording this on Friday morning and we are in the midst of a banking crisis. CDS on banks such as Deutsche and Barclays were rising rapidly yesterday, which means their cost of funding is rising. The market is losing confidence in the banking system, and that can lead to a self-fulfilling prophecy. So there is likely to be a credit crunch, and that is highly deflationary. Now, we don't know as yet the extent of that credit crunch and hence of degree of monetary tightening leading to falling economic growth. We'll just have to wait and see. Full-blown banking crisis would contract the money supply hard leading to deflation, not inflation. So inflation would then come down very quickly. Stuart, how have you been doing this week? Well, obviously, Keith, I wouldn't know on a week by week basis. I have mm. one takes the longer term view, but uh, that's just covering up um, a, a not particularly um, impressive performance. Uh, year to date, I'm down 3.3%, which I think is underperforming both yourself and, and Richard. Uh, as ever, uh, there's a trickle of income to, to support me. I had a look at today. My portfolio has got a 4.9% yield. Um, as I've covered in previous uh, Portfolio Matters episodes, I'm more fully invested uh, than Keith and Richard. For me, it, it's time in the market rather than timing the market. And I've got to accept that that means that sometimes I'm going to be 
dragged down uh, as markets are weak uh, because I don't believe in my ability to, to time the in and outs very well. Uh, in particular, I've been hurt by interest rate sensitive uh, bets, uh, REITs, which I've covered before, uh, some of my infrastructure stocks, these typically sort of yield four and a half, five and a half uh, percent, um, hopefully with a measure of inflation growth um, in the long term. But obviously that's become much less attractive and therefore the share prices have weakened as interest rates have, um, have gone up. And the same logic has applied to some of my secured lending trusts. Uh, in terms of activity, not too much, but one uh, small buy of note was Biopharma Credit. This is a diversifying bet. This is an investment trust that lends to um, pharmaceutical companies that need money uh, now uh, against the revenues and royalties they're expecting from their, their drug launches in the future. It's got a really quite strong track record, um, but trades on about a 6% discount to the estimated NAV. Uh, the dividends are a bit lumpy. Um, uh, often the credit that they extend includes some prepayment uh, penalties. So if a company does pay back the, uh, the, the credit uh, early, by pharma credit gets you know, a nice little bump, which it pays out as a, as a form of special dividend. So a bit of a, a different situation and definitely diversifying, nothing to do with the economic cycle, all to do with the ability of that investment trust to uh, understand the, um, uh, the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, as we've covered uh, in uh, talking about money market funds, um, I've um, made sure that all my, uh, my pound exposure is in uh, a short term uh, bond ETF. Uh, the one that I'm using is ERNS from iShares, which I think has got about a 4.2% yield to maturity. So I'm just painting out in that to, to, to protect um, my uh, cash exposure. Very good. <clears throat> Thanks, Stuart. And on to my own portfolio for the week. So I had a pretty indifferent week, down 0.4%, all shares down 0.1%. So... I am now down 0.4% on the year and I'm underperforming Richard and the All Share, but not Stuart. So sorry, Stuart, but that's a bit of good news for me. <laughs> not doing too well either. Now, I did do have some activity this week. I sold a bit of the PIMCO Short Maturity Sterling ETF, which I'm using for cash, making me a decent small return. And the PIMCO um, short maturity ETF also pays monthly dividends, uh, which I've not included. So my return will be something like 1%, which is pretty decent and actually holds the cash outside of my broker. And so is protected in the case of the uh, my broker going bust. And I invested the money in gold, so that was my big investment of the week. Um, I now have a 5% position. And having done that work on timing of when to invest in gold and turn positive on gold last week, I decided to put my money where my mouth is. I also added to my positions in the 2068 and 2071 gilts. Those are big positions and I have high conviction in them. Obviously, so far that hasn't worked out. But if there's a credit crunch, then I expect economic growth and inflation to slow sharply. And all the data we have been presenting is essentially historic. The banking crisis represents a break, a Minsky moment, and we're just going to have to see what happens from here. So this is the iShares Physical Gold ETF, which is the vehicle I am using to hold gold. You see that gold has been a very good investment in the long term. Now, last week we talked about how the trigger for my bond investment was going to be when the US one year fell below the Fed funds rate. And so the market was then expecting lower interest rates in a year's time. And last week it had crossed zero and so was indicating that my bond trade was on. Well, this week, unfortunately, it's recrossed. 
and is positive again. So saying that I should have held off. Now, this is 2068 index link guilt. And actually, this chart was not updated for yesterday. It's shown a bit of a bounce and it's bounced further this morning. Is that a change in the trend? We certainly hope so. And if there's a credit crunch and inflation slows rapidly, then I expect yields to fall and bond prices to rise. Now, the other thing about the index link gilt is that you get RPI. And we know that in February, RPI was 1.2% month on month. Now, the 2068 gilt has a three month lag. So in the month of May, you know that holding the 2068 gilt, you will make 1.2%, i.e. the February change in RPI, over the month of May and the indexation. So as long as RPI stays elevated, index link gilts are providing a good return. And this is a 2071 gilt, which is not index linked. OK, thank you all for watching. Richard was away this week. Thank you very much to Stuart Owen for dialing in from Tokyo. Financial conditions have changed over the last couple of weeks. We are waiting to see the extent of the credit crunch and how that affects markets and the economy. So good luck out there. Be safe. Don't to take too much risk. And in the meantime, please can you press like and subscribe to the channel. And it's goodbye from me, Keith Jordan. Goodbye. Full disclaimer. The material and information contained in this podcast is for information and entertainment purposes only and should not be relied upon for making a business, legal or any other decision. We may own or have a financial interest in any securities mentioned. Listeners should conduct their own research or consult a professional investment advisor before making any decisions regarding topics mentioned on the show. Whilst we endeavour to ensure that the information presented on the show is correct, we make no representations or warranties of any kind, expressed or implied, with respect to the podcast and website or to any information, products, services or related graphics discussed or presented in the podcast or website. Any reliance you place on such material is strictly at your own risk. You are solely responsible for the investment decisions you make. We will not be responsible for any errors or omissions in the podcast or website, including in articles or postings, for hyperlinks embedded in messages or for any results obtained from use of such information. Nor will we be liable for any loss or damage, including consequential damages, if any, caused by a reader's reliance on any information provided by the podcast or website. Please do not listen to the podcast if you do not accept self-responsibility for your actions.